the two speakers that we have today, and um, in order of their appearance, are uh, Jim Sace and uh, Charles Funk. Jim Sace is um, with the Washington State Historical Society, and he's been the liaison to the Lewis and Clark National Historical Park, um, and has worked um, in that capacity uh, with those associated with Station Camp and uh, Middle Village um, unit of Louis or the Lewis and Clark National Historical Park. And so he comes here in that capacity. Uh, Charles Funk is a Chinook artist in Harvard, um, and he's a member of the Chinook Tribal Council. He's also um, been involved in the coordination of Station Camp Middle Village. And um, I just want to mention, he's not going to be talking about his artwork today necessarily, but he does have an upcoming talk in Cannon Beach on October 10th um, at Northwest by Northwest. So if uh, you're interested in that, that would be the place um, to, to find out more about his artwork. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jim. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Katie. I sort of consider myself a farm boy who became a biologist, worked as a planner, and now I work for a historical society. And that makes me what I consider a natural historian, which is to say, I like the natural history side of the environment. I don't consider myself an anthropologist or an archaeologist. Um, this first uh, image is a Google Earth image. By the way, Google Earth is a powerful tool if you're interested in landscape ecology, or just landscape in general. And I'll be talking about this for about 20 minutes. A really good discourse on this would take an hour or two, but I don't have that time. Here's the Astoria Mega Bridge. Here's a little rocky point here. Here's the old ferry dock. This is the original ferry dock, actually, that served the Columbia River um, before the Megwood Ferry Dock, which is up over here. You can't see it. Here's um, the Sundown RV Park area. This is the area of what was called Old Chinookville, or the Pioneer Settlement area was sometimes called Old Chinook or Chinook or Old Chinookville. Uh, here's the stream drainage. Here's another stream drainage. Here's the McGowan Mansion area. Here is the station camp area. There's the McGowan Church. There's a spruce tree right there. Remember that spruce tree. Here's Fort Columbia, and the rocky headland that makes up Fort Columbia. Um, this uh, landform here is about a square mile. It's the Fort Columbia State Park. And some pretty old timber here. If you were to walk up in this area, you'd see some beautiful old timber. This all sort of relates to what I'm going to talk about, which has to do with sort of the physical geography and ecology of the area, and how it relates to this beach here along. Um, the shoreline. Now you guys just whiz along here like me at 55 miles an hour and don't even think anything about this. So this is a chance to slow down and go back in time a little bit. From an airplane, this is what a portion of this looks like. Um, the dominant feature <coughs> is this very heavy riprap wall here. And by the way, this is a town of Chinook. It's also called White's Point historically. Here's Scarborough Head. You can see the heavy timber up here, which is all part of the National Park. But excuse me, State Park. And then here's the church. There's that little spruce tree there. There's a little gallon mansion right here. And by the way, you can interrupt me if you have questions. No problem there. So if you look at the seawall right now, which is really what it is, heavily armored, you're driving along the highway. <clears throat> In general, you're about four feet above the old shoreline. That's about how high this was raised. This used to be the old route of the train, 1908 and on until about 1930. Um, this river rock was placed about 1960 to stabilize the shoreline at that point. And um, here is a minor, sort of a minor low tide. You can see the rocks have fallen down. But the structure was never here originally. This was dominated by um, driftwood more than anything else. Here's the church, of course, up there, the Gowan Church. Um, 1944, Charles Mulvey, excuse me, about 1949, Charles Mulvey, who was a famous watercolorist who um, lived there in the Seaview area. It's a really nice sketch of McGowan. It's hard to believe this is about 1949. Sort of in the same perspective, here's the road. The road's a little bit lower. There's sort of an open field-like expanse, a row of piling set to keep driftwood from flying up on the road. Um, a few rocks. They did place some rocks here when they built the um, train line in 1908. Here was the old uh, pier that went out into the water. And so if you were here in that era, that's about what you would see. These structures here, these two barn structures, no longer exist. Um, the um, bunkhouse, two-story bunkhouse, no longer exists. The cannery, you can't see it, but it's behind the church. It no longer exists. But basically, today, the environment's the same thing. It hasn't changed all that much. And there's a couple of reasons for that, which I'll explain later. 
Um, this is a really interesting um, navigation chart done by the Vancouver, uh, actually William Roth, he came in the river in the fall of 1792. And I point this out for a couple of interesting reasons. There was a very deep channel that ran along the north side of the Columbia here. He anchored at two points, one off this point here. Um, I've calculated this is probably Fort Columbia point here, the Rocky Point. This is what we call McGowan, and this is what we call Point Ellis. He also anchored just inside Point Ellis on the upstream side. Notice a big sandbar here, and then another very large sandbar here. I'll mention this sandbar. Um, also, this one you can see a low tide it's driving across the bridge. But there's a very deep channel on this side of the river. Um, in 1851, 1851 is an interesting time. It was a few years after the treaty between Oregon, excuse me, the treaty between the United States and British Columbia, which set the boundary of this uh, current state of Washington between us and British Columbia. And, uh, James Swan came down here in June of 1851. And he, uh, in the morning, he went out in an early sunrise. Here's the sun coming up. This, uh, light system is really good and sort of washed out the sun, but there's the sun right there, it's early in the morning. And here's um, St. Helens, it actually shows up better than the graph. And here's what that rocky headland I was pointing to there, uh, Point Ellis. Here's a sandy beach that comes out, and he's sitting on a log and he sketches this, and these are the Chinook working with the pioneer settlers, um, saying in Sam early in the morning, 1851. And, uh, I'd read, like many of you, perhaps I've read Swan years ago, but I kept thinking about this blasted image because I wanted to know where this was. I was really curious about this. This tells us something about the beach because the beach does figure prominently in history. Uh, William Park calls it a beautiful sandy beach. And James Swan calls it a sandy beach of uh, 20 to 50 rods wide in some places and up to a mile wide in other places. So I've been trying to interpret that. What does that really mean about where that beach is? Why that beach then relates to other things, which I'll investigate as I get older. Um, in 1851, the U.S. also did a um, coastal survey of the area, so we have this real contrast here. This, done by James Swan in 1851, and this published by the uh, Survey of the Coast of the United States in 1851. And here's Point Ellis here, right there. Here's now, this says Chinook Point right here. You'll notice that the cartographers and chart makers can't make up their minds whether Chinook Point should be here or here. And over time, it sort of goes back and forth. But this is approximately where the McGowan area is today. And this is probably where the Fort Columbia is. The chart makers have an interesting take on the landscape. So they show the sort of a concaveness of this coastline. And then they show gradations in feet here out with your low water line or your sandy beach line out about this far, and then this large sandy area that extends out here in front of Port Columbia. This has some other features which I'll talk about later, but um, one of them I want you to know, they call this Cape Hancock right here. It's not called Cape Disappointment. They couldn't make up their mind whether it should be Cape Deep or Cape Hancock. Uh, can you see that? No. no. Yeah, your fingers over there. Your fingers over there. How's that? Right there. Sorry, I'm pointing. <laughs> on the finger of the light. So there, right? That's called Cape Hancock. And you can't read this here. It says, future location of proposed light. So in 1851, they already thought that this headland, which is Cape D, would be a good place for the light. There's Mackenzie Head right there. It says Chinook Hill right here, which is this great sort of triangular shape. Bear place here. Um, this is Point Dallas right here, and this is the point above Pillar Rock right here. That's actually above Altoona. It's quite a distance. Here's St. Helens, here's Tongue Point, and here's uh, Point Adams right here. So you have a real contrast. Here's the uh, federal government coming out and actually doing the navigation channel. Why? The Columbia River would eventually be developed for <coughs> serious navigation. And I'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, here. Thank awesome.